Okay. Good afternoon. It is officially good afternoon, everyone. It's good to see you all. It is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Erin Rodriguez, who studies family and sociocultural influences on children's coping and adaptation to stress. Her research, research focuses primarily on Latinx families living in low SES context. The aim of her work is to reduce pediatric health disparities through culturally relevant family-based interventions for youth faced with medical illnesses and other chronic stressors. Dr. Rodriguez's current studies include an intervention study with Latinx families of children with asthma, a longitudinal study of bilingual language development and mental health in Latinx adult, adoles sorry, adolescents, and an investigation of sociocultural contextual influences on family adjustment to pediatric cancer. She's an associate professor in the Department of Educational Psychology at the University of Texas at Austin, where she is the program chair of the school psychology program in the Joe R. and, the, and Teresa Lozano Long Endowed Faculty Fellow. She received her doctorate in clinical psychology from Vanderbilt University and completed her clinical internship and postdoctoral fellowship at the Institute for Juvenile Research at the University of Illinois at Chicago. Her work has been funded by the National Institutes of Health, as well as the St. David's Foundation Center for Health Promotion and Disease Prevention Research and the Society of Pediatric Psychology. Very excited to have you here today. Please join me in a warm welcome, and I will go ahead and mute myself and you can take it away. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Stewart. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so we can get started. Um, it's so great to be joining you all uh, today and um, talking about work that, um, as Dr. Stewart said, is very near and dear to my heart um, um, with Latinx families, and in particular, um, trying to understand the psychosocial context of pediatric asthma for these families. Um, so the title of my talk is Stress and Coping with Pediatric Asthma, um, Developing an Intervention for Latinx Families in Low SES Contexts. Uh, I want to share just a little bit about um, my background and academic journey so you understand kind of where I'm coming from and, and how I'm approaching this work. Um, so I did my um, kind of uh, a graduate training in clinical psychology at Vanderbilt. And that's a little picture of the children's hospital there at Vanderbilt. Um, and then for my internship and fellowship, moved to the University of Illinois at Chicago. Um, and I was in the Institute for Juvenile Research in the Department of Psychiatry there. Um, that's actually where some of the initial work that I'm gonna be talking about today uh, was first conducted. Um, and then from UIC, I came here to Austin and I'm currently at the University of Texas at Austin um, in the College of Education um, and uh, within the Department of Educational Psychology and, and the School Psychology program here. And I've been here um, since 2014. So um, the, the rest of this work has been here in Texas. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm gonna be um, talking a lot about that, um, that work that we've been doing here in Austin. Um, I wanted to also just talk a little bit about my professional identity um, and how that informs my work. And so, um, as I mentioned, I'm trained as a clinical psychologist and in particular, uh, a focus, have a focus on child clinical psychology. But within that, um, an even more specific identity for me is as a pediatric psychologist. Um, and pediatric psychologists are really interested in um, promoting the health and well being of children um, within a medical setting or children faced with um, chronic medical conditions um, and understanding the relationships between physical health and mental health um, in kids. And of course, physical health and mental health are not necessarily distinct um, constructs. Um, and that's why I had that bi directional arrow there. Um, but um, we can really think about those, those things as connected and as. Um, psychology and as behavioral science, um, being in a position to really understand that connection um, and support kids in both of those domains. Um, and so that means, you know, I, I'm primarily situated within a college of education, but also have affiliations in a psychiatry department, and I have collaborators um, in other medical settings, um, the UT School of Nursing um, and the Dell Medical School at UT. Um, I have collaborators in population health. So that's kind of my world. That's, that's where I'm um, situated and operating in um, from a professional identity standpoint. Um, so to give you uh, just an outline for today's talk, um, today I'm going to be talking about my research on pediatric asthma 
and um, in particular, um, how some of this work has informed the development of a um, psychosocial coping skills intervention for Latinx families um, who have a child with asthma and who are living in low SES contexts. Um, so the initial work and kind of the seed for that intervention grew out of some observational research uh, that, I, that I did um, looking at family coping with pediatric asthma. Um, and that grew in and developed into a mixed method study um, that looked at stress and coping with asthma in Latinx families and really trying to understand the, the cultural context of that, as well as the socioeconomic context. Um, so families who are living in um, low SES contexts and how both of those factors influenced stress and coping with asthma. Um, and then finally, I'll share about um, the development and piloting of the coping skills intervention for Latinx families. Um, and that was piloted through a small scale randomized control trial. Um, and then I'll touch on some um, ongoing and future work um, in this area as well. And um, before I jump into that research, I do wanna just make a quick note about terminology um, through this talk. And I'm gonna be using the term uh, Latinx, uh, which is a term that um, has a lot of um, thoughts and feelings um, about how people use that terminology. The reason I, I use that um, is uh, really to, um, one, distinguish um, from other terms that are used such as Hispanic. So um, Latino or Latinx really represents individuals who have origins um, in Latin America versus Hispanic, um, would, would, which would also include individuals from um, Spain and of Spanish origin. Um, and then using the term Latinx versus Latino or Latina um, um, to describe a, a group of people or a population of people, that is really meant to be more um, gender inclusive and to reject just a simple male, female, gender, bi gender binary. Um, um, that being said, I want to acknowledge there are um, kind of differences across things like generation, generational status, um, and preferences for, for using this term. Um, and in Spanish, um, the letter X is often not even used. So um, you can, may also hear terms like Latin A um, that are also meant to be um, gender inclusive. Um, but um, within academic circles, it's been um, more common to use the term Latinx. So um, that's how I'm approaching this talk, but also want to acknowledge um, the variability out there of the Latino and Latinx population. Um, okay, so um, for those of you who um, maybe are not coming from the world of pediatric asthma, I wanted to start us off with a little bit of background on pediatric asthma um, and, and the scope of the problem in the U.S. Um, so approximately 10% of kids in the U.S. have asthma, um, and some of those kids have well-controlled asthma, but a lot of those kids have poorly controlled asthma or uncontrolled asthma. Um, and we know that poor asthma control can result in a lot of challenges for kids and for families. So for kids, it can result in mixed, missed school or activity limitations. For parents, they may miss work caring for their child. Um, and there's a huge cost to society in terms of health care, sort of lost school and work and productivity. Um, there are also um, pretty large disparities in who is affected by asthma, um, not only in who has asthma, but also who is experiencing uncontrolled asthma. Um, so for Black and Latinx children, there are elevated rates um, of asthma prevalence um, for Black children, as well as for Latinx children and certain um, Latinx ethnic groups, um, specifically um, Puerto Rican origin youth. Um, and um, so we know that there are disparities there in terms of prevalence. There are also disparities in terms of um, uncontrolled asthma and some of those disproportionate effects uh, of uncontrolled asthma. We also know that kids who are living in poverty or who are living in low SES contexts have elevated rates of asthma. Um, and then um, getting more specific about the Latinx uh, population, um, there's a lot of variability by Latinx subgroup. So for example, I mentioned Puerto Rican origin youth may have um, some of the highest rates of asthma in the US. Um, on the other hand, Mexican origin um, and Mexican American youth have um, much lower rates. Um, but there's also some recent research that suggests prevalence rates are increasing in uh, Mexican origin youth. Um, there's also a big increase um, from rates of kids who are living in Mexico compared to Mexican origin youth who are living in the US. 
Um, and then finally, beyond the question of prevalence, there are higher rates of uncontrolled asthma and the consequences of uncontrolled asthma for Mexican origin youth. So that shows up as higher rates of short acting beta agonist use, um, double the rates of hospitalizations um, compared to non Latinx white youth. Um, so there's a real um, disproportionate impact of uncontrolled asthma for the Latinx and for the uh, Mexican origin um, youth population. Um, as multiple studies and extensive research has shown us by now, um, there are really multiple environmental and structural factors that contribute to poor asthma control um, for low SES, Latinx, and Black youth. Um, just do a few of the things um, that have been shown to affect um, asthma from a structural or a environmental perspective are things like access to health care, um, pollutants, and other environmental exposures that can affect asthma. Um, and within the healthcare system, things like patient and provider interactions. Um, and um, one thing um, that's come out of that research is the link between some of those broad structural and contextual factors and how, um, how those are related to stress for families and the stress of managing asthma under those conditions. Um, and then um, in addition to kind of that research on stress and, and on these sort of social determinants and structural determinants of asthma, um, we, there's another research particularly focused on um, behavioral um, and emotional challenges related to asthma. And so um, that research has shown that having pediatric asthma is associated with increased risk of emotional and behavioral problems in kids, um, as well as depressive symptoms in parents. Um, and some, so those mental health concerns and, and challenges really play a role um, and can interfere with asthma management uh, at a family level. Um, so um, if we think about that context of stress, stress and that context of mental health, um, what, what, how, we, how might we, um, face that? What do we know from the field of behavioral science to really um, think about how we might um, intervene with that? Um, so one literature that um, I've drawn upon and I think is relevant to this question is the literature on coping. Um, and there's a pretty vast literature looking at um, coping and its association with mental health problems. Um, there's less research. There's, there is sort of initial research and then some of the studies I'll talk about um, contributed more to this work, but there's also some evidence that coping plays a role in children's asthma outcomes. Um, previous findings have been mixed, and I'll talk a little bit about um, findings today from my work. Um, but um, prior to my work, there really had been limited research that used empirically supported models of coping. Um, and so what is an empirically supported model of coping? Um, the um, researcher has really suggested that there are dimensions of coping, um, kind of um, primary and secondary control being two empirically supported dimensions. Um, and so we could define coping as conscious and volitional efforts to regulate either oneself or the environment in response to stress. Um, and the um, dimensions, two of the dimensions that have been shown to be kind of empirically validated are primary control coping and secondary control coping. So primary control coping um, involves attempts to change a stressor or one's emotional response to a stressor. So that could be things like problem solving to try to change the situation or things like emotional um, modulation um, to try to change how one experiences it at an emotional level. Um, and then there's secondary control coping, um, which instead of directly trying to change a stressor, really involve attempts to ad um, adapt or accommodate to a stressor or to adapt or accommodate one's emotional response to a stressor. Um, so what does that look like? That's kind of thing, um, the type of thing like um, using cognitive restructuring um, to think about the structure in a different way, um, perhaps using things like acceptance um, or distraction in the moment to really adapt to or accommodate um, the stressor in, in one's life. Um, so I was really interested um, in applying some of this research on coping to the field of pediatric asthma. So for the first set of studies I'll talk about, um, those were guided by a couple of research questions. Um, one is what are the associations between coping, mental health problems, and asthma outcomes in children with asthma and their parents? Um, and second, do parent and child um, mental health problems really account for or mediate those relationships between coping and asthma outcomes? Um, and um, foreshadowing some of the work I'll talk about next, I was really interested in looking at this 
um, in a sample of uh, racially, ethnically diverse families who were living in low SES urban contexts. Um, so in the first study, um, we recruited a, a, a sample of 78 families um, of children who were ages five to 17 with asthma um, from an asthma specialty clinic in Chicago. And um, within that, we had parents who provide, provided reports on their child and themselves. And we also had a subset of 42 children who were um, ages nine to 17, um, who were old enough to complete self-reports on their own um, asthma and coping. Um, the sample was relatively diverse, um, majority um, Black and Latinx, and within that Latinx sample, 91% um, were of Mexican origin, um, and um, about half of the Latinx um, sample was Spanish-speaking. Um, the sample was also living in pretty low SES um, context, so they um, about 90% of the families um, had an income of 50000 or less for a family of four. Um, most of the parents who participated were female and about a third of the, the children were female. Um, and we measured coping um, through the stress and cope, the response to stress questionnaire. Um, and we also measured parent um, depressive symptoms using the back depression inventory. Um, we measured child emotional and behavioral problems with the strengths and difficulties questionnaire. Um, and then we uh, assessed asthma control through both parent and child report. Um, the asthma control test for kids and then the asthma therapy assessment questionnaire for parents. Um, and then finally, we also asked parents about missed school. So how many full days of school did their child miss? And how many partial days of school did their child miss due to asthma in the past three months? Um, so the first uh, analysis that we conducted was really focused on parent coping and child asthma outcomes and looking at the potential mediating role of parent depressive symptoms in that relationship. And what we saw um, ultimately um, for these two outcomes, so we looked at asthma control um, as an outcome, and then we also looked at um, the school days missed, and we looked at partial days of school missed because that ended up being a, a significant outcome. Um, but what we found ultimately um, after we controlled for some of the demographic factors is that um, when we included both coping um, and parent depressive symptoms in the model, we found that there was a significant indirect effect of secondary control coping on children's asthma outcomes for parents. So um, that indirect effect was expressed through parent depressive symptoms. So it um, kind of supported this um, hypothesized model that we had here. Um, and that was, uh, again, true for um, the asthma control outcome um, and for the um, um, and for the partial days of school miss outcome, it was true um, only in terms of a direct relationship with parent depressive symptoms. Um, and then the other thing I want to emphasize here is we tested this model with primary control coping um, as well and did not find any um, significant associations with child asthma outcomes. And so um, the, the kind of um, outcome here that really rose to the front or forefront was secondary control coping um, in relation to parents coping. Um, the second analysis we looked at was really um, related to child coping and child as asthma outcomes and looking at whether child emotional and conduct problems was a potential mediator or factor could, that could account for that relationship. Um, and we found a pretty similar story uh, in that, um, first of all, we didn't um, find any relationship with primary control coping um, as a predictor of child asthma outcomes, uh, but we did find significant relationships with child secondary control coping. Um, and in this study, we were looking at um, models with child report of coping and parent report of child coping. So both parents and kids were informing on the child's um, coping strategies. Um, and uh, in this model of child report of coping, um, we found that there was a significant um, direct effect of the child's emotional and conduct problems on asthma outcomes. And then we also found that there was an indirect effect um, through emotional and conduct problems for the um, effect of child coping on asthma outcomes. Um, and then um, the story was very similar for the parent report. Um, we found both a significant direct effect of child emotional and conduct problems, and we found an indirect effect um, for the um, relationship between coping and asthma, outcome, uh, asthma outcomes um, for, um, through child emotional and conduct problems. 
Um, so to kind of summarize these findings, um, we found some evidence for the direct association between secondary control coping um, and asthma control for both parents and um, children. Um, and that we also found that parent and child secondary control coping um, was indirectly associated through this kind of process of mental health problems. So for parents, it was through the depressive symptoms and through children, it was through emotional symptoms. Um, and again, we did not across either study find that there was a relationship with primary control. So it stood out to us here that um, secondary control really seemed like a, a more relevant process. Um, so that was sort of the initial thought of, um, or planted the initial seed about whether coping could be leveraged as a potential protective factor for both parents and children. Um, but I do want to acknowledge um, there are limitations to this study, in particular, um, the relatively small sample and the cross-sectional design, which wasn't really designed to test any type of um, causal relationships. Um, and, um, you know, when I'm talking about prediction and outcome, those are really statistical terms. We didn't have um, kind of a longitudinal design either. Um, so this was really um, kind of hypothesis generating and got us thinking about um, the role of coping here. Um, but the next step was really to have a more um, kind of rigorous empirical um, and sort of experimental design, and also to understand the specifics of these relationships within the Latinx context. Um, so the next study we did, um, did in fact focus um, specifically on Latinx families, um, and it was a mixed method study. So we looked at um, both correlational um, results, as well as some qualitative data to really understand this within Latinx families. Um, our research questions here um, were um, three different questions. So one, what are the stressors experienced by Latinx children with asthma uh, and their families who are living in low SES contexts? Um, two, what is the relation between level of asthma-related stressors? Um, and then children's and parents' use of primary control coping and secondary control coping. Um, and three, what are the processes that shape the perception experience of asthma-related stressors and coping for these um, families? And when I say processes, we were really attuned to what processes are gonna be most relevant or potentially most relevant for Latinx families living in low SES contexts. So we wanted to explore familial, cultural, immigration related and socioeconomic factors that potentially um, were shaping these families' experiences. Um, and so this was a, again, a myth, mixed method study that had a sequential design. Um, we incorporated quantitative data from multiple studies or multiple samples. Um, and some of those quantitative analyses, including the ones that I just presented, really inform the development of our qualitative focus group questions, as well as how we interpreted that data in terms of the development of themes. Um, so again, our, qualitative, our quantitative sample um, for this study was relatively small, um, but involved 15 of the families who had participated in that study in, um, that I just presented on um, from Chicago. Um, and we combined that, that group of 15 families with a small sample that we collected in Austin of 24 Latinx families. Um, within those two samples, um, we had pretty similar demographics in that um, just related to um, kind of national origin. So across both studies, families were primarily of Mexican origin and the um, profile of family income was pretty similar. Um, so we, we chose to combine those and give us a little bit more of a um, kind of larger sample with a little bit more statistical power to look at those um, associations. And then our qualitative um, study uh, involved parents and kids, a total of 11 um, participants um, who were in focus groups. Um, and um, I'll talk about the questions that we asked them. But those families also had pretty similar demographics to our um, our families who um, were recruited in Austin for the quantitative component. Um, so they had comparable, um, they were from the same clinic and had pretty comparable demographics. Um, the way we looked at um, stress in um, these families from a quantitative standpoint was again using the response to stress questionnaire. And you can see some of the items that um, are asked on that questionnaire. Um, things like um, things that um, many families report as being stressful about having a child with asthma. So for kids not being able to do things because of asthma, having to go to the hospital or clinic so often, having to take medication every day, um, 
and then for parents, some similar things and also impact on things like work um, and on communication within the family. And then for our qualitative interview questions, um, we really wanted to understand um, families' experiences of stress and coping, make sure we, you know, our quantitative research hadn't sort of missed anything about their context. Um, and then we also really wanted to narrow in on how their um, kind of identity and background as families um, who are Latinx and living in low SES context could have affected their asthma uh, management. So for parents, um, you know, we asked about how asthma was managed in the family. We also asked about um, sort of the, their history of immigration to the US um, and whether that affected their child's asthma management. Um, and for kids, we asked about, you know, for themselves and for their parents, what is it like for them to have asthma? Um, and then our, some of our questions also kind of looked forward to um, our future research and intervention and asking, you know, what do you need? What do your parents need to help, um, you know, manage your asthma and live with your asthma? Um, so in terms of our quantitative analyses, first we looked at the association between stressors and how families um, kind of coped with um, their, their um, those stressors. Um, and then we also compared um, things like how did children's own reports of stressors compare with their parents' reports of their stressors and then their parents' self-reports of their own stressors. Um, it turns out that kids reported the lowest levels of asthma-related stress. Um, and then parents thought that their kids were more stressed. So parent reports of children's stressors were higher than kids' own self-reports of stress. Um, and then finally, parents' self-reports of their own stressors were higher than both parent reports of child stressors and child self-reports of stressors. So parents themselves were actually reporting them those stress related to um, their child having asthma. Um, and the things that most frequently came up as either somewhat or very stressful um, were kind of different across kids and parents. So for kids, it was things related to role functioning and how asthma impacted their, their functioning. So things like missing school or falling behind in schoolwork, not being able to do things because of asthma. Um, and then for parents, it was um, typically things that are, were more related to their um, caregiving um, and having a child with asthma. So concerns about their child having an asthma attack or not being able to help their child feel better. So they were kind of experiencing different types of stressors related to um, their child's asthma. Um, and then in terms of the associations between those stressors and the types of coping strategies they were using, um, kids who reported higher stressors um, reported using fewer secondary control strategies. Um, again, we didn't find a relationship here with primary control um, coping um, for kids. And then um, in terms of parents, parents who reported higher levels of asthma-related stressors reported lower levels of both primary and secondary control um, coping. Um, so for parents, we did see primary control be significant as well. Um, and then uh, our qualitative findings, I think really contextualize um, some of these quantitative findings a bit more um, in the context of um, Latinx families and, and living in low SES contexts. Um, so one thing that came up was that their experiences um, were described in terms of multiple elements of the family system. So the child's experience and the parent's experience um, were definitely included, but they also talked about sibling experiences, how the family as a unit um, experienced it and how extended family members experienced it and were involved. Um, we saw um, just in terms of the stressors that they experienced, what that looked like for them, that um, as their challenges of controlling asthma kind of grew, that ended up um, causing these consequences um, of having uncontrolled asthma. So if they weren't controlling their asthma, their child's asthma, um, that ended up being a stressor that led to a bunch of consequences. And those consequences, in fact, reinforced some of the challenges. So it became sort of this vicious cycle that the more stress they experienced, the harder it was to manage their, as their asthma and then that leading to more stress. Um, we also were able to kind of identify um, sort of overarching processes that influenced and shaped how families experienced stress and how they coped with asthma. Um, and we would categorize those as either Latinx specific processes, 
SES specific processes or cultural general processes that were not specific to Latinx or low SES contexts. Um, and I'll show a, a figure in a minute that will give you a, a little bit of a better idea of what I'm talking about um, in terms of how this worked. Um, finally, um, we also saw that asthma management was sort of a, a mediating process that was shaped by these cultural and socioeconomic processes and linked then to how families experienced stress and coping. Um, so what this actually looks like is um, up here, we had these processes that shape stress and coping. So SES relevant, Latinx relevant, and general processes. Um, and some of the things that came up that were relevant to their socioeconomic status were things like literacy, um, a lack of resources and access to healthcare. Whereas for Latinx specific processes, we saw things um, at the family level and at a kind of macro level. So things like the value of family connectedness and how siblings were involved and motivated to help, um, how extended family communicated with the nuclear family about asthma. Um, and then things like how um, gender roles spirituality and um, transnational experience were expressed um, within the family and how that influenced um, asthma management and healthcare um, processes. So these processes were all sort of involved in shaping how um, families managed um, their child's asthma. And that asthma management um, was sort of a mediating process or a process that linked these processes with um, the family's asthma related stress and the way they coped with asthma. Um, and here were just, again, some of the challenges um, or stressors that families really highlighted for us. Um, so again, things like the caregiving burden came up, um, you know, and echoed some of those quantitative findings. Um, things um, really seeing here um, how families experience this from sort of a mental health standpoint um, and how some of those challenges of uncontrolled asthma led to some of these mental health concerns. Um, and then on the other hand, um, families described um, some of the coping strategies consist with, consistent with our model of, of coping. Um, and I, I just have selected a few quotes that I think really um, help understand what, what this means and drives some of these results home. Um, so one of the consequences of uncontrolled asthma um, really links to this sort of idea of, of mental health um, challenges or problems. So one parent was saying, you know, during an asthma attack, you imagine that the medicine is not going to help, that at any moment the person is going to die. Um, in your desperation, you call 911. With that fear, you're like traumatized. So they really linked it to this sort of um, trauma and, and this sort of mental health experience. Um, in terms of an SES relevant process, um, kids talked a lot about sort of a lack of access to um, appropriate care. So this child said, my mom had to put the medicine in me too, but we didn't have none. She was so sad and mad. And in fact, we saw a lot there where kids were sort of reflecting on their, their parents' kind of mental health and mental concern, uh, mental health problems and concerns related to asthma management. Um, and then on the flip side, we saw some kind of um, positive processes um, in which sort of the family's identi identification as Latinx um, and with those um, cultural specific values um, really um, shaped how they were coping with the disease. Um, so this parent shared with us, you know, her perspective that God does not give us any disease, but if he does allow it, it's because he wants you to get something better. If you didn't have asthma, would you understand another child who has the same condition as you? No, that's why he allows you to have asthma so that you're more sensitive, more human. That makes us much more grateful. So this parent was using this process of spirituality to really reframe the experience of asthma for herself and for her family and for her child. Um, and that's, you know, an example of a, a secondary control coping skill right there um, that that was sort of grew out of this sense of spirituality. Um, so I think, you know, this study also had some implications um, for intervention. Um, so one is that we really need a family-based intervention approach for um, Latinx families in particular, um, and that intervention should or incorporate primary, but especially secondary control coping skills. Again, we saw that significance for primary control with parents. Um, so it's not like it's totally irrelevant, but both parents and child and children really had this strong relationship between stress and secondary control. Um, also that 
both socioeconomic and culture specific processes shape Latinx families experiences and should guide intervention design. Um, and finally, that some of the intervention components can leverage Latinx specific processes to support coping and asthma management. And a couple examples of that are what I just mentioned in terms of spirituality and secondary control coping, but also family connectedness and how that can be used to support asthma management within the family. Um, so that kind of leads me to the final study I'll talk about today, which is um, the development and pilot testing of the coping intervention um, for Latinx families in low SES contexts. Um, and this intervention really came out of that previous, all this previous work that I've um, just talked about, but also the current state of the field and the fact that interventions for pediatric asthma have really, have rarely addressed psychosocial and behavioral components um, from kind of a coping perspective and a mental health perspective. Um, there are two um, coping interventions um, in the literature um, that, um, you know, have shown positive effects. Um, one was focused on parents and focused on problem solving, so primary control intervention. Um, and another more recent study from 2019 um, was a school-based program. It incorporated a wide variety of coping skills, um, but it didn't, um, it only focused on kids. It didn't include parents. Um, so there's been really limited research um, with Latinx families, um, and there's also been limited research really using a culturally relevant approach to intervention. So I really wanted to use the previous work to inform um, both of those elements uh, of the intervention we developed. So our goal here was to develop and pilot test a combined coping skills and asthma self-management intervention for Latinx families um, who were living in low SES contexts. And we wanted to look at, um, we know that it was feasible, that it was acceptable, um, and ultimately, you know, wanted to tailor it to be delivered through primary care services. Um, and so that's how we developed Adapt to Asthma, which is um, a seven session program. Um, and it covers content on both coping and self-management. Um, and that coping content was drawn from existing interventions, um, a program called Act and Adapt that was originally developed um, to prevent depression in middle school students. Um, but we drew from that and pulled some video guided pieces of that um, to really, um, you know, make it relevant to coping with asthma. Um, but it had that mental health com component there. Um, and then um, we also drew asthma management content from a program called the Asthma Plan for Kids. Um, and that was empirically um, tested and, and research has supported its um, kind of efficacy. Um, it was actually developed by, you know, one of my collaborators uh, who worked on this study as well. Um, and then um, we, in, in addition to those kind of coping and self-management pieces, we incorporated um, culturally relevant content that, you know, we, we learned from our previous studies, but then we also continued to refine through this piloting process. So our initial pilot um, didn't necessarily have all the elements of cultural um, tailoring, but by the end of that study, we sort of had a good idea of exactly what, how we wanted to culturally tailor this intervention. Um, and you can just see here from the table of contents, um, there's content that's in black, which is the asthma management content. There's content in blue, which is the coping content that really incorporates um, kind of mental health as well and stress and education around that, as well as coping skills like problem solving. Um, and then the red um, highlighted text is um, activities that really contain an element of um, kind of cultural tailoring um, that have uh, that were specifically designed for uh, Latinx families. Um, and we first um, kind of share, shared our materials with focus groups and got their feedback before we actually, you know, delivered the intervention to families. So we interviewed, um, you know, a small group of youth and parents, but we also wanted to get feedback from primary care providers because long-term we were thinking about, you know, how do we implement this in real world um, healthcare settings. So we interviewed primary care providers um, from clinics in Austin, and we asked all of these people about intervention content, delivery and acceptability. Um, and then we used a uh, framework analysis, which is an approach that um, kind of identifies places of convergence and divergence across the different stakeholders about their perceptions of the program. 
Um, once we got the feedback from the focus groups, um, we then tested it. Um, we kind of refined the intervention a bit more and then tested it through this pilot randomized control trial. Um, and that enrolled 24 um, families, uh, Latinx families of children ages nine to 12 who were recruited from primary care clinics in Austin. Um, the families were randomized to either uh, adapt to ESMA or enhanced usual care. And our enhanced usual care um, condition um, provided them with a single session um, where they received a asthma education booklet with activities. Um, and they also received a peak flow meter and were taught how to use that. Um, and then they got a follow-up phone call after that session to answer any other questions um, that they had. So they didn't get nothing. They got enhanced usual care, but they didn't get the coping skills or the full asthma um, management intervention. Um, and the main outcomes that we were interested in were the feasibility of the program. Um, so looking specifically at participant retention and the, um, the facilitator's um, fidelity to delivering the intervention. Um, also acceptability, which was measured through our enrollment numbers and our um, participant satisfaction ratings. And then um, we looked at proof of concept, meaning we looked at the effect sizes between groups. Um, we didn't expect to see like statistically significant differences between the groups because of the small sample size, but we did want to look at um, whether there were, you know, small, moderate or larger effect sizes between the groups as an initial indication that adapt to ESMA might have some um, support for its efficacy. Um, and our main outcomes that we compared across the groups were asthma control um, reported by the parent and child, um, the primary and secondary control coping skills that they were reporting, um, and some functional outcomes like missed school days and emergency department visits due to asthma. Um, so um, in our focus groups, families and providers um, kind of shared three main things um, that we kind of used to refine the intervention further. One is they wanted kind of increased relevance for um, Latinx families in low SES contexts. So an example of this is um, we had some videos in English and we had subtitled them to you know, put them into Spanish with subtitles, but um, families really expressed they wanted dubbed videos. Um, and that was a, a issue of literacy and the ability to kind of read subtitles. So we dubbed the videos instead of, um, you know, using subtitles. Um, we also incorporated more tailored language around spirituality. So um, we had addressed spirituality based on previous findings, but in the focus groups, people told us even more so, like, this is really important. You really want to get families talking about this because this is going to be something they resonate with. Um, so we kind of expanded the discussion that we had with families around spirituality. Um, we had um, questions about uh, feasibility and acceptability in particular related to home visits. Um, and the intervention was designed to be a, a home visiting program um, and most families completed it at home. Um, parents were really excited about that and kind of uniformly liked the idea of home visits, but the primary care providers had some concerns and makes sense if they were the providers going to the homes that they might be thinking about it from the provider perspective. So they were concerned about things like um, whether the families would feel comfortable with home visits. Um, they were concerned um, as well about, you know, how do we guarantee safety and, and train providers to go into homes. Um, but at the same time, they saw some benefits of home visits. And those were things like, um, they thought that the home visits would really give us a sense of the family's kind of social determinants of asthma and the full context that families were living in as they managed their child's asthma. So they actually liked some aspects of home visits, but just had these sort of pros and cons. Um, and then the third thing that providers and families both mentioned was that we need something to address the typical gaps that happen between providers and patients or between providers and, and families. Um, and both providers and parents commented that, you know, they'll often have an interaction with one another and then the provider kind of thinks the family understands everything and the family really feels left in the dark or that things were not explained in a way they can understand. Um, and then maybe the next, you know, appointment or the next um, clinic visit, the family is not implementing things or doesn't, still doesn't understand what was previously discussed. Um, so we wanted to really make sure we um, incorporated a lot that would sort of, um, you know, just 
um, reinforced families understanding that we really clarified and made sure that communication was clear between our intervention facilitators and our um, you know, families. And so we included a lot of interactive re review activities from session to session. And we also had facilitators rate how they thought the parent and child understood the intervention. And that was incorporated into our supervision um, when we talked about um, kind of what that intervention, um, what each family was you know, going through for the sessions and um, supervision for the um, facilitators. Um, in terms of feasibility and, sex and acceptability, um, we saw that, um, you know, we had kind of moderate enrollment numbers, so about half of families who were identified by their clinics um, ended up participating, um, but we had pretty high retention, so um, about 92%, and it was equivalent across the two groups, um, stayed in the study through the whole ses seven sessions for Adapt to Asthma and um, even followed up with us um, for our follow-up assessments. Um, in terms of fidelity, the um, facilitators self-rated it, which is not the best way to measure fidelity, but it's what we looked at for the pilot study, and that was quite high as well. Um, satisfaction was also pretty high, um, and I think the key here was that satisfaction was pretty similar across ADAPT to asthma and the enhanced usual care conditions. So even though the enhanced usual care was probably a lot less burdensome for families in terms of actually having fewer sessions and not having to meet as much. Um, both were kind of equally satisfied with the program and felt that it was convenient and met expectations. Um, and then here's our kind of main results in terms of our um, group, you know, comparisons. Um, and again, you know, we weren't expecting to have statistically significant um, differences across um, adapt to asthma and enhanced usual care, but we did look at the effect sizes um, and we found effect sizes that were um, kind of small to moderate in two outcomes. The first was the parents report of um, asthma control and um, parents actually reported a greater improvement for adapt to asthma compared to enhanced usual care. And then we also found um, a greater improvement for adapt to asthma in parents secondary control coping. Um, and that was a, a slightly larger effect size. Um, both groups showed um, actually a, a good deal of improvement in terms of the functional outcomes, so we didn't really see a differentiation there. Um, and then we did not see differences in terms of the child's self-reported asthma control or coping. So in terms of the conclusions, um, you know, we think that this pilot study showed us that you know, overall the study and the program is feasible and acceptable. And in particular, once we can enroll and engage families that they remain engaged. Um, and that we think that the home visits likely increased retention. Um, and what that means is we probably, if we wanna move this into, into clinics and into the real world setting that we need to leverage provider perceptions about the benefits of home-based care um, because they did see certain benefits to that. Um, and then uh, in terms of our outcomes, the, there were those greater effects on parent coping um, and parent reported asthma control for adapt to asthma compared to enhanced usual care. Um, so this is, you know, a, kind of a signal or a relative potential benefit of adapt to asthma, but um, we definitely need a larger randomized control trial to test that. Um, and then I also think, you know, the fact that we didn't really see any change for kids in terms of coping or um, asthma control probably means that in our pilot study, we needed to do more to developmentally tailor the intervention for kids. Um, and really, uh, you know, that's some of the findings that we took forward into the next phase of the study um, to really think about how can we incorporate and involve kids a lot more in this intervention and kind of make sure they get it too, um, that it's not just targeted to parents. Um, so um, luckily and kind of excitingly, we are able to now test this intervention at a much larger scale. Um, and so uh, we were funded to test the ADAPT to asthma with 280 Latinx families. Um, and in our larger scale randomized control trial, we're actually using community health workers to facilitate um, the intervention. So in the pilot study, uh, graduate students in psychology were facilitating it, which, you know, that removes one barrier in terms of um, delivery of the intervention. But we, again, want to move towards thinking through how we can implement this through a primary care system. So um, community health workers are a great um, possible way to make this more um, kind of potentially disseminable. Um, and then in the future, really, um, I think 
some of this work suggests a few different um, lines of research and, and areas to explore. One is thinking through, you know, how can we implement these types of behavioral health um, mental health um, informed interventions within primary care and what types of supports do um, people who are not behavioral health providers need to deliver an intervention like this. Um, and we're learning a lot about that right now as we um, test the study with community health workers. Um, I think also, you know, um, as I mentioned at the very beginning, there's so much variability within the Latinx population and there's been so little work um, look, looking at the kind of um, subgroup variability in relation to asthma outcomes and the role of Latinx identity um, in relation to asthma. And so that's a um, area um, really for future research. Um, and then finally, um, you know, one of the findings that we had from our mixed method study was that families were really um, receiving care transnationally. And a lot of the families would have a provider in the US and may see providers in Mexico, for example, and their child be treated there, you know, um, in another country and then come back to the US. And yet there's absolutely no integration across those different healthcare systems. Um, and even for uh, individuals who are immigrants or families who have recently immigrated, their child's healthcare has been in a totally different system in another country before they arrive to the US. And so how can we as providers um, and as kind of behavioral health scientists think about um, integrating those systems transnationally to really um, support children's health and, and well-being. So I think um, that was it, um, except for my thank yous and acknowledgements. So um, I'll thank everyone in my lab who um, contributed to this work, our community collaborators and also research collaborators and funders. So um, yeah, I'm happy to take any questions at this point. Thank you so much. That was a really fantastic talk. I um, we have some questions in the chat, and I also have a question. And and you beat me to the chase here, so you can go first. And <laughs> thank you so much, Barbara. So this is not an area of research that that is an expertise for me. So this was a wonderful review. Thank you. I do remember, however, related to what you were mentioning, that there are substantial differences, right, between Latinx uh, populations. I think um, I remember seeing a study, now this is like 20 years ago, looking at kids across different sites. And also, I think for US American kids in particular, being struck by the difference in prevalence, really substantial difference in prevalences with uh, some kids having twice as much a rate of asthma. And so I'm just wondering um, what your thoughts are, because I do think that one of the general messages that I retained was that, um, yes, Latinx populations were incredibly under-researched, and yes, we were going to make new mistakes if we didn't appreciate also the heterogeneity. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so I think, um, one thing I think in the research that's sort of been understudied coming into this work is um, and sort of underappreciated is the burden of asthma within um, Mexican origin families. Um, and that's been because, you know, historically rates of prevalence have been have appeared to be lower in, um, you know, Mexican origin families in the US, especially compared to you know, Puerto Rican origin for families who have the highest rates of asthma across any group. And, um, you know, so um, I think, you know, although I presented my results um, in one way as, you know, sort of this pan Latinx ethnic um, sample, it really is actually primarily Mexican origin. And I think speaks most directly to that um, group's sort of experiences with asthma and sort of the one, the just under recognition of it as a problem and under resource for those communities um, in terms of healthcare. Um, yeah, there's a lot of interesting work even coming out of Austin just in the last couple of years showing, you know, there's amazing disparities in things like hospitalization rates and, you know, things like um, emergency department. So the burden of uncontrolled asthma for that community is so, is so large. So I think, you know, if I were to situate my results, you know, I would want to say it's, it's directly applicable to that population within the Latinx community. 
Um, but I also think, um, yeah, there's, there's just so many other factors um, within um, Latinx families besides, um, you know, shared, potentially shared cultural values or, or language factors that may influence access. Um, so many other things that we know impact asthma control, even, you know, racial identity and how that's so variable within the Latinx population um, that's been completely ignored in terms of asthma, um, you know, uh, disparities. Um, and then other environmental and structural factors that influence different Latinx populations in different ways. Um, so I think that is just a research question on its own to sort of say, what is that immense variability in these um, social determinants for Latinx groups, um, different Latinx origins, and how that impacts asthma control. Um, so I don't know if that addressed your question or just reiterated your question, um, but I, I just hope like some of this work can kind of inform our understanding in, in pieces of that much broader question um, and probably speaks most relevantly to the, the Mexican origin population. No, that's really helpful, including what you're mentioning about potential underestimates of prevalence so that basically the, even the data the disparate data that we had looked at maybe may need to be updated so. yeah absolutely thanks thanks for that response because i had a question about social determinants of health right so how do you you know, we know, right, that in um, the social determinants of health, increase, decrease, morbidity, morbidity, and mortality for asthma, right? And so, how does that? How do you? Um, how do you wrap that into like addressing SDH in your treatment plan or action plans, and in the treatment that you've um, already constructed? How how do you foresee that fitting in? Yeah. Um... That's a, a really good question. So I think um, we were trying to get a little bit at that in the mixed method study where we really, at least at a very basic level, sort of broke up like Latinx relevant processes, socioeconomic relevant processes, and then sort of general processes. So I think some of those socioeconomic processes, you know, we labeled them as socioeconomic, but they, they incorporate these different social determinants of health in some ways. And we're really meant to just distinguish from kind of more culture specific processes. So, um, so that's how we sort of initially wanted to capture some of the social determinants. The other thing I would say just in my work is really um, trying to approach these questions um, and these intervention designs from a very kind of local community oriented perspective. So this intervention that we ended up developing is really specific to the needs of the Latinx community in Austin, who are primarily, you know, um, majority immigrant um, families and their children are, you know, the first generation born in the US. So there's a lot, there's um, a lot of, you know, language barriers and, and language um, factors that, that are at play. Um, it's also a population that happens to be rural and sort of on the outskirts of the city. So that really influences just the topography of, you know, what factors um, impact their, their asthma access. Access here is a huge issue. There's one clinic here for an entire community of nearly 100,000 people, um, you know, in terms of pediatric primary care. So it's, it's really, really specific. And our, our, the development of our program, I think, is really specific to our local context. And so um, I would say, you know, for people thinking about like, how does this generalize to other contexts in the US? Um, maybe it's a question of more so using our methodology to think through how you might develop some of those interventions that are really specific to your population, because every population is going to have that, you know, have their unique needs and unique strengths and, you know, really should be um, using the methodology we have to sort of develop things um, in that way that are really tailored to the, the needs of that population. Thank you for that. Um, Ethan, you have a question? Your hand's raised. Uh, thanks so much, Dr. Rodriguez, for this really um, interesting and important talk. I'm just curious what the spirituality um, conversation part of the intervention involves. Yeah, um, yeah, that, that was definitely something we, we like developed and, and it grew and grew and grew. Um, so we use spirituality as sort of an introduction to using the skill of acceptance, which is a secondary control coping skill. Um, and we start off by just asking families and really, you know, parents on the one hand and then children 
you know, tell us about your, your um, religious beliefs. You know, are you a member of any organized religion? Tell us about your spirituality. Um, and then we ask them, you know, how does that spirituality affect how you think about your asthma or your child's asthma? Um, are there ways that that's been helpful to you? Are there ways that that's been challenging to you? And so we really use what they tell us in terms of their own spirituality. We don't assume, you know, like every Latinx family is going to come, you know, be Roman Catholic or anything like that. We really try to tailor it to what they tell us. Um, although oftentimes, you know, families will be very much like a very religious and, and that's a, a big piece of it. Um, and then, you know, talk about things like, well, how do they, if they mention, you know, um, that spirituality is something that um, helps them think about their, their child's asthma or their asthma in a more accepting way, you know, we use that an example as an example of like, here's how this coping skill is really relevant to who you are as a, as a per person and your cultural background. Um, and it kind of helps us make that skill more accessible and more acceptable and feel more relevant um, to the families. Um, but we definitely started out as like a conversation with the family and try to learn from them exactly how it's showing up in their own life before we try to prescribe any way to use it from the intervention. I have like five more questions. Um, <laughs> but when it's one o'clock. <laughs> Maybe I'll just email you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I'd be happy to talk with anyone offline or definitely. That would be fantastic. Um, I so appreciate your time and everyone's time today. This was a really great talk um, and really a great reminder that we really need to be thinking about these medical conditions, um, especially as it relates to our children who are most impacted um, by social determinants of health. So I really, really, really appreciate all the work you've been doing. Um, so take care, everyone. Thank um, you. Enjoy, stay healthy, stay calm. Take care. Thank you.